for me personally, can I surrender to whatever circumstance I'm in right now so that I can see clearly enough to move forward? Because what was happening was I was fighting my current situation, whatever I was in, I was fighting with my, my current and my past self so much, just beating myself up, trying to understand why and how could I have done things differently or how could I have shown up differently or said something differently or chosen differently. And, um, and it was totally keeping me stuck. It was keeping me absolutely trapped, like paralyzed from moving forward with my life. Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke, a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hey Maggie, thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm so happy to be here. I am doing great. You're catching me at a really wild time in my life, so I'm excited to talk about it. And obviously, I love you so much. I'm sitting in front of your posters, your human design oh, chart. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to be here with you. <sighs> Well, thank you for taking the time. And we met last year. Was it last? Was it last year? <laughs> yeah. <I've been. laughs> like <I've> been, <laughs> life has been expanding in many beautiful ways. And so, I mean, so many things, so many reasons why I wanted to interview you other than like, I love your energy, how you show up, how you also kind of share your like how you interpret human design in a very, I guess, relatable way, friendly way. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, I, I learned so much, like I've heard those things a thousand times, but something about the way you say it hits differently. So I just, you know, that's why I'm excited for this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, it was so fun to, to first to meet you and to share charts because I've never yes. met somebody with a chart so similar. I mean, we obviously have, there's, there's several differences, but just at a very like basic level of definition. Yeah. You know, so it was so nice to see that. I was like, whoa, there's somebody like me. What does that mean? And obviously, like you said, it's very different, but also very similar. So Maggie also has, um, define the channel of surrender which is the 4426 and I'm sure we're going to go deeper into how it's felt for you <laughs> the differences that we notice but before we go super deep I wanted to let our listeners know a little bit about yourself so who are you Maggie <laughs> who are you today <laughs> yes who am I today oh my gosh I know before we were recording we were talking about how hard of a question this is to answer sometimes and sum up um but I would say I'm a human design guide. I'm a human design student. Um, I'm a mom to three young boys. I'm a wife. Uh, and really, I'm, I'm an explorer of all of those big unanswerable questions in life. That's been something I've, I've invested most of my time and energy into for as long as I can remember. Was that something that was always driving you in a way? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, obviously there was a, a period of my life growing up where I probably wasn't aware of that. Um, but I think that's always been my baseline. That's always been something that I've explored and wanted to um, uncover and spend my time on. And I don't, I, I can't explain why, um, but that is definitely a driving factor in my life. Yeah. Yeah no pressure to hold on to look into the unknown. <laughs> I'm really, I, I know now, of course, right, um, that most of my questions will never have answers, um, just avenues to explore. And mm -hmm. when I lighten up in that way, it has become a lot less of a burden and more of an excavation, you know, and, and, and something that I enjoy doing. That was so beautifully put, like, you know, holding the, the questions, knowing that there might never be like 
answers or maybe the answers might change. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And for sure. I mean, with so much, with so many undefined centers, and maybe you can relate, especially with that undefined G, uh, I realized that was a huge source of pain growing up. But now being able to be malleable and be flexible and say, okay, I'm exploring this avenue. I don't know what, what this road is going to, or where this road is going to take me. Um, and I might have to switch gears. I might have to turn around. I might have to take that other fork in the road um, and being okay with that, which means mm-hmm. shedding identities and um, beliefs that maybe are no longer healthy for me, changing my mind, like all of those, they, it sounds so simple when we talk about it, but I think that was a really big source of um pain might be a little tough, but just kind of inner turmoil. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I can definitely relate. And I like, thank you for bringing that up because I think many, one of the many reasons why human design was so validating was when I learned about my undefined G center that, oh, it's not like I can stick to anything. That's not my problem. Like, oh, quitting my career wasn't my problem. It wasn't because I was too weak. It was all those stories until I was like, oh yeah, you're meant to move through different expressions and that in a society where they want they want certainty they want you to build your career be great at one specific thing we don't really fit Mm -hmm. especially as projectors especially with all those undefined centers I mean yeah it, it really I think the way that we're supposed to move through the world is so different and we're human design at least has given me such a permission slip to explore that mm. so how is your life I guess before human design yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I would say so I had a pretty a pretty normal vanilla childhood I'm an only child um, both of my parents worked very hard growing up and so um I think I I was I've always been very independent and I've always been um I always trend towards work. I really, I do enjoy, I do enjoy work. I do enjoy my career. Um, but I always thought there was a very linear path, right? Um, I, I did all the things I was supposed to do. I was an A student. I was involved in all the organizations that I needed to be in. I got the scholarship. I went to college. I got the degree. I started my career at a finance job in Chicago. Um, and, and I hit a point, um, after about six years of living in Chicago and doing all of the things that I was supposed to do where I was deeply unhappy. Um, I was insanely burnt out. Um, I think I was on the verge of a total breakdown and um, I decided to leave the city, leave my job, leave the city. Um, I moved to Minnesota, Minneapolis area. Um, This is where I'm I'm from originally. And, And the cycle started again. I picked up right where I left off, I found a career in tech and I dove right back in thinking this was going to be different. And a year or so into that, my burnout hit even harder. Um, and then I, you know, I just walked away from it all and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what was next. And that's what really, I think, set me on a journey of self-discovery of figuring out, okay, something in my life isn't working anymore. Um, the mold is not meant for me. Um, I would argue it's probably not meant for many people, if at all. (laughs) Uh, And, and, and while doing all of this, um, I, I spent about a decade as a yoga instructor. So I was always had one foot in that world, um, in the world of, you know, of listening to my body and mindfulness practices. And, um, I really was not practicing what I preached at all. And so after leaving, uh, my, my career in tech, um, yeah, I started fresh. I started over and it's been a really kind of a long winding journey ever since then to find my place and find what, what feels good and um, where I can really make impact um, without burning myself out. Mm. Wow. How was the process of you, I guess, deciding that it's time to walk away? Because I think a lot of our listeners are at similar points where like, I've done all the things I'm supposed to do. It's not working yeah. <laughs> and it's daunting. God, this is so, I think this is such a personal decision. Now, of course, looking back, I would have probably done things differently had I known a bit about <laughs> design, right? The first line does like foundations, does like to have things lined up um, and have some sort of a path, but I totally third lined it and I burnt down everything in my life. 
Um, and I think that was really necessary. I, I, I hit a point. So when I, when I moved back to Minnesota and I started in tech, I started, uh, in a pretty demanding role in terms of time spent in the office, um, and time spent on meaning like being in front of people, working with customers, working with a team. I was managing a small team at that point, And I never had an opportunity to turn off. And, um, I think I hit a point where I knew that I was going to get sick or I was, I I was going to like get in a car and drive away and not know where, like not know what was going to come next. Um, (laughs) You know, I, without being too dramatic, I just felt, I think it was probably that splenic intuition that said like something has to change and it has to change right now. Um, and yeah, it was painful. I mean, especially being so conditioned to do the right thing. I mean, that yeah. was something I think that was, I wore like a badge of honor for so long. Um, and, and so to just quick cold turkey with no plan um to go through the season that I went through of being you know broke and like floundering and trying on different roles and and working in different spaces um yeah I mean it wasn't glamorous (laughs) yeah I mean I echo all of that that was very similar to my experience I'm like doesn't work I had nothing lined up I'm like I'm just quitting (laughs) and I'm as you were speaking I was thinking I was like I wonder if it's also like our defined heart energy that was so happy about committing to that thing and then realizing it wasn't for us. So having to pull out of it, it's it's kind of a shock, like for everyone, anyone, but especially with the Defiant Heart that was so proud of the accomplishment. And it's like, yeah, not for us. What? <laughs> yes. And that recognition, right? Like, I don't know if you feel the same way, but looking back, I stayed in things for so long because the recognition felt so yes. good. It was- such incorrect recognition that I was never recognizing myself. I mean, this is what's so wild about all of this is I had such like on the surface, totally fine, right? Like, great. I'm doing well. I'm doing super good. I'm not letting anybody in on this inner process, but underneath I was an absolute mess. I hated myself. I had such low self-esteem. I had such poor body image. Um, I, I, I just didn't enjoy who I was. I, was never proud of myself. I never recognized myself. I was never good enough. Um, and the the gift that this whole process gave me was just that, you know, I know we've probably all heard this, especially everybody listening to your podcast, right? Like this concept of self-recognition and self-acceptance, um, which is something human design has just blown open for me. But that is what this whole process gave me was the journey of that self-acceptance and of loving myself despite all of my outer accomplishments. <laughs> I'm just like so moved. <laughs> no easy thing to do. And I think especially when we're in that space of not knowing what the next step with and we're feeling disconnected from ourselves, the next step feels so far. It feels like we have to like leap and jump. And looking back, I'm sure it's very similar for you. It was just like, a matter of taking the next step. It was hard, but there wasn't, you know, we couldn't have planned it. It was more like, what, how can I take care of myself now? Yes. Yes. And for, especially if we look through the context of human design for, for both of us as splenic projectors, I mean, this is how we're designed to live our life in the now, not knowing what's ahead, having a vision, I think is great but not knowing what's ahead and what, where, where this path is going to take us. And then radically trusting that is so scary sometimes. Yes. But I don't, I'm sure you do too. I have so many examples now of how my life has unfolded when I've done that either consciously or unconsciously. Yes. And knowing that I'm supported because sometimes it's, we want control, right? (laughs) We want to make sure that we don't end up X, Y, Z, but okay, sure, you can prepare as much as you can. There are so many wonderful opportunities that blossomed because I guess the fourth in our community, or if you have a four in your life, a pro- four profile, they will connect you to opportunities. And I kept seeing things happening that I was like, did I, wait, what? Like this is happening? I didn't plan for it. Like when I surrendered, but if I sit and I plan for things to happen, it rarely happens. hundred percent that, that, gripping of control that 
that desire to, you know, I'm also, I'm a Virgo. I have a lot of Virgo, a lot of cap in my chart and wanting to have things like unlock, knowing what's coming, knowing that I'm controlling what's happening. It, you know, it's, it's something I've strived for for so long and it has, it has absolutely backfired on me every single time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've like, I realized that I've blocked off so much magic in my life when I've done mm -hmm. that. And, um, and, you know, I, I won't sit here and say this process is still easy for me. I have to consciously show up every day and say, it's okay that this is not messy or this okay that it's not figured out. Um, but life is so much sweeter when I do. And I think is your sun sign personality sun in 45? 47. 47. 47. Oh. So my design son is 40 is 45. Right. And there's also some controlling energy there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Learning about gate 45 for me was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> right. Right. How would you how would you define it in your own words? Or how do you see that reflected in you? Yeah. So, so gay 45, when I think about it, like I think about the keynote of that kind of big queen king ruler energy and, and at its, at its highest and at its greatest, it's this, um, it is this beautiful leadership energy designed to support your community and, mm -hmm. and it's lower form. It is, it is almost tyrannical and there is a level of control that comes with that, that I think is, that is not great. And I have definitely seen that in myself at times. Thank you for sharing that too, mm -hmm. because I think learning about these details and like, you know, the higher expression and the low expression can give us also compassion. Like we have that energy and sometimes we might be in the shadow expressions and that's totally fine, but it also gives us a, an awareness of what to work with or on. Yes. I can catch myself in the, in the lower energies of, of my design now um, and not feel so ashamed you know, look at it a little more objectively and say, okay, well, this, this is happening. I'm not going to be my own worst critic in this moment, but I can, it is my responsibility now. I have guilt motivation, right? It's my responsibility now to, to shift this into something else, to shift this into something higher or better or less destructive. <laughs> <laughs> in a more aligned way, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know you've taken a lot of and the way that you share it on social media, human design work through, you know, as a parent, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Human design has transformed the way I parent. So I have um, three sons. Uh, our oldest will be three um, next month. And then we have twin boys who just turned one. So we have three under three right now. So they're very young. Um, and I can see their designs coming into play so much, especially with our toddler, Calvin. And um, he's a 3-5 sacral MG. Um, our twins are 4-6 emotional generators. And it's been a really beautiful and hard experience um, learning to work with all of their energies. And really kind of get out of the way. You know, we talked a lot about wanting to control outcome situations. Um, I see my 45 wanting to come in and lead here. And my 35 MG toddler has the 4521. So like he's the king in this house. And uh, and so it's a really, it's been a really grand experiment to say, how do I give him freedoms to express himself? How do I sit with him in his anger, right? With the MG anger and frustration. Um, and how do I set healthy boundaries to keep mm -hmm. him safe, to make sure he's, um, you know, a, a well-rounded or like a, just a decent human being to other people too. Um, it, it's, no pressure. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, it's a mess, but it's been, but human design has given me such a beautiful lens to look at situations and um, to have compassion for, for them, especially for our, for Calvin, our toddler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially for yourself, who's amplifying their energies too. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Absolutely. And I, and human design has given me a, a huge permission slip when it comes to being a parent. Um, not trying to keep up with 
others that I see around me who I think are maybe more engaged or active parents. Um, I think I really do best and I support them best when I step back, when I'm present with them, when I'm available to guide them when they want it um, without feeling the pressure to be fully in it all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and that has really been a great conserver of my energy. um, And it has been really good just for my well being in general. um, Because I found that the more I pushed, the more I pressured myself to be super, super engaged all the time, the more exhausted and resentful I was. Yeah. And something that I forgot to mention at the beginning, Maggie is a two, four projector, splenic projector. So with seven centers open <laughs> and needing the the alone time, you know, the, the hermiting away. And that is easier said than done, especially as a parent where they need you all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, just so much understanding, especially like two, four profile was really what kind of blew my mind when I first found human design, because I craved, I craved alone time. I craved space to be engaged in whatever I wanted to be in engaged in. I craved that so badly. And I always felt guilty as a, you know, as a wife, like, why do I want to, why do I want some alone time? Why do I want to get away? Why, you know, as a friend, like, why am I burnt out after just a few hours together? And I need some space to recharge. Maybe you can relate even as a fourth line. Right. Um, and then as a parent, you know, why I, I, especially, you know, over this last year, I stayed home with our twins. Um, and towards the end of their first year of life, I was desperate for space away, just desperate because for a full year, 24 seven, I'm, I'm glued with these babies by my side, which, you know, is something I'll always cherish. And I really needed space from, and to be able to like, to say that out loud without feeling guilty, to know that just a little time away even is so good for my well being. I'm going to show up so much better for them. Um, I really, I'm so grateful for this system and that it resonates with me because it's given me so much permission in that arena. Thank you for sharing. I think especially as a new parent, there's already a lot of pressure and guilt. And then add on top of that, it hasn't been easy couple of years, you know, outside of our, our bubble. It's been very, very challenging, but at least it's so nice to see how human design can support people in supporting themselves in the process. Yeah. Well, and I keep thinking about if I had, I mean, human design finds us in our perfect timing. That's what I think. Right. But if I had known a little bit more about myself <laughs> as a young person, yeah. I probably would have done things really differently and, and, and that's okay. And now I see this gift that we can give to our children and like sitting with our toddler in his bout of anger and frustration. And, you know, I mean, this is happening, I think across the board and in parenting now, whether you know about human design or not, but, but looking at situations like that, looking at, you know, Calvin, our toddler is a completely open identity center, no gates attached, nothing leading towards it. So he's probably going to be trying on a lot of different things in his life. And how do we support that rather than hold him to what our expectations are about what he might be into or not? It's none of really our business. Our business is to expose him and support him along the way. Um, I mean, just those simple tools in general are really powerful. I think, you know, our, our twin boys have very fully defined G centers they're right across of the sphinxes, which comes out of that identity center completely. So to, to even just to know that about the differences in those three and to parent them differently accordingly is, um, I'm just really excited to see how it's going to continue to play out yeah. as they go. Right. And like, thank you for mentioning like the different types of parenting, <laughs> because it is going to be different for every child. And I think a lot of us in you know, our generation that we, our parents didn't have as much language and, or like emotional bandwidth to support us through who everyone is on an individual level, either it's comparing with friends or like, why are you being spiteful? And there's been so much knowledge and more compassion infused into raising kids nowadays. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. I totally agree. And I'm, 
I'm really looking forward to see what kind of magic this generation creates. So all three of our boys have the 6124 defined from the head to the Ajna. And I don't remember which planets they're in, but I've noticed that a few of friends who had children around that same time also have the 6124, right? And the 61 is that big, those big unanswerable questions, the, the desire for the mysteries of life. And I just, I love knowing about this system and having it be my primary lens right now, because it makes me wonder what, what kind of magic are these kids going to create in our world? What new systems and ways of thinking and being are they going to introduce because they're asking the big questions? Um, that's something I get really excited about. Yeah, yeah, that's so yeah. much. I'm like, can you, re- when they're yeah. older, record and share their quotes, share their <laughs> wisdom with us? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, I always say to hold this system lovingly and loosely, but right now it's so much fun to live our life through the lens of this design. And it, it is making me a much more compassionate mother, um, for myself and for everyone in our family. Yeah. And you also share a lot about relationships and I love everything that you infuse into it. Can you talk a little bit about how you've applied or, you know, yeah, just use those lens and relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I love looking at connection charts. And uh, so connection chart is when two individual charts come together and we look at how the energies are at play as a couple. Um, you know, I've always had an interest in, in intimate and personal relationships. Um, it's something I studied in college. There was a hot minute where I thought maybe I'd go on and become a marriage counselor, uh, or marriage therapist. And, um, I really, I just see the benefit of knowing about your partner's design and working with it. And I've seen it play out in my own marriage so much. My husband is a three, five sacral generator, um, also has a defined heart. Um, and we, he's right angle cross of Eden. Um, and, you know, I feel like we're constantly going into this, like these, crisis, like crisis experiences or um, experiences that are really meant to um, shift and challenge us in some way. We also, our electromagnetic is the 3828, you know, the channel of struggle. And so there's a lot of really kind of fiery energy in our chart. And how do we work with that together? How do we um, honor each other's differences and how we move? And, you know, he's a sacral being and needs to move his body and need, and he's a very active parent. And that's where he finds a lot of joy and fulfillment. Um, if I were trying to keep up with him in that way, I would constantly be burned out or felt, you know, feel like a failure. Um, and then when we've got this fiery energy, how do we cha- or channel it into something that's we're mutually passionate about. And for us, a lot of that is parenting and how we're showing up for our kids and the life that we're creating for them. Um, and knowing that that energy exists in us, whether we're channeling it in a good way or not, um, there's just so much here that I think we can touch on. You know, Sean also has a defined Ajna and a defined throat. So the way he communicates his ideas and beliefs is so different from how I communicate. Um, and just learning about those pieces has really yeah. transformed how we communicate. Um, I used to feel a pressure to be able to not only articulate, um, but freely share my beliefs, my ideas. Um, and now I, that pressure is totally released. I know that that's something that I do in a different way than he does. I mean, there's so much here I could go on and on, but, yeah. um, I've seen so much magic unfold when meeting with couples and just finding that awareness and learning the awareness around each other's differences. It's instant compassion for the other. Yes, yes. And it's it's so interesting when we know about the electromagnetics that bring us together and what the potential um, tension that might come up from it. That's so powerful because it's not a problem that you're not compatible, like quote unquote, because it's really a decision of how you're showing up and how you're influencing each other. Yeah. I mean, you, you've done a connection chart for your husband and you, right? How and you- it's very, it's very similar to, in a sense that he's also a three, five sacro generator single definition and it's like so much energy he has a defined identity center he also has a channel of struggle and I would often feel pulled into that struggle and be like what that why is your life so hard why do and then he also has a Christ and I would be before human design feeling like 
okay, how can I help him hold? How can I fix these things? When after human design, it was like, there's nothing to fix. This is just part of his process. So how can I let him be in that process without feeling bitter myself or feeling that what the hell is happening? And also like give me a tool to, oh, how do you use my energy efficiently too? Mm hmm. Yeah, yes. That is, I think, so key and not trying to keep up with it all. Not trying mm-hmm. to fix it, like you mentioned, but also not trying to keep up with it all. Yeah. That's been so liberating. Yes, that was a huge one because we one of our electromagnetics is the 15 and the five. So right now I'm blanking on like, I think one is called gate of extremes and the other is called fixed rhythms or something like that. Do you have the, you have the 15? I have the 15, the gate of extremes. Mm-hmm. And he has the five unconscious. And when I first learned about that channel, I'm like everything makes sense about the tensions that we experience. He would want to do certain things like wake up early and I'm, I couldn't catch up. I would sleep in late and I would feel so guilty about it. And like, why am I sleeping late? But then realizing I needed alone time that I wasn't getting. And, you know, all those little misunderstandings that we try to do to orient ourselves towards our partner, but end up backfiring because we're not listening to ourselves. Especially you with the undefined identity center being pulled into his kind of into his world, right? Like he's sort of running the show in that space and recognizing that and saying you have different needs. Yeah, it's so powerful. I can totally see how when you when you don't have a system or a tool like this to name some of the things that are happening, it can create so much tension and so much conflict that you just don't even know how to resolve. Exactly. And now that you're talking about conflict, there was a post that you shared about um, conflict or the horsemen's. I'm just paraphrasing so poorly. Can you speak a little bit into that? How human design has helped you navigate conflicts or even, you know, be able to process conflicts in a, in a way that is efficient and not just fighting and butting heads. Yeah. Yeah. So the post you're referencing um, is uh, I, I I put together a list of some of the gates in human design as they might relate to Gottman's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. So um, John Gottman, very kind of well-known relationship researcher. Uh, I'm sure he has a much more uh, accredited and official title than that. <laughs> but he has these Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, let's see if I can remember them. It's, it's criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. If these four any combination of these four characteristics are present in relationship, um, you know, he predicted that often there, there, it may lead to the relationship's demise. And um, what I saw there was the shadow side of, of many gates in our charts, I think can lead to some of these characteristics and some of these um, uh, actions or emotions. And, and, Again, human design is not good or bad, right? Everything exists on a spectrum. If we know that we have several gates that might tend towards conflict, that might make us naturally more defensive, that might put us into a pretty dangerous position of contempt, which is, you know, I think one of the the worst characteristics that you can embody um, in relationship. When we know these things about ourselves, then we can work with them. So with with so with Sean and I, for example, having the channel of struggle, um, I have the 38, he has the 28. The 38 wants to fight for something. And if it doesn't find something worthy of fighting for, it's gonna fight anyway. So I would find that I would have this adrenal pressure to pick a fight or to just like something would open up and I would I would say it, I would go for it. I also had gate 22 in a really prominent placement, right? I can use words to cut really deep when I'm in a ro- low expression. And and knowing that these are these are energies that move through me and what I do with them is of it's of importance. I can I can say, okay, I'm moving into this really low expression. This is not helpful. This is not supportive. I need to release this energy. So I'm gonna go to a kickboxing class. I'm gonna go for a walk and calm down. I'm going to go in my car and scream my brains out for 10 seconds, you know? I mean, just to release and move that energy. Um that has been really powerful. And that's, I found just kind of a fun correlation there. 
Yeah, yeah. I thought it was brilliant. I'll I'll try to link it in the show notes so people can also see it. And I love how you mentioned, you know, how to move that energy because I truly believe the energy, like you said, it's not good and bad. It's about how do we move it in a way that is supportive for us because we need to release it. Sometimes energy wants to be moved. And something that I think we've shared is that um, with our partners, the 1222 is one of our electromagnetics. And yes. that is such fiery energy that... Gosh, when I learn about it again, so validating. It's not like we, it's not like we're not communicating properly. It's simply like sometimes there is a lot of buildup of that emotional energy and it wants to be moved. So it takes patience, stepping away, which for me was triggering a part of myself like we need to solve it now. And, you know, that was like, whoa. So giving me the language of, you know, what the tension is, how, how it's better to work with it was like, oh, okay, this is, I'm feeling insecure, but it's not about that. It's just, we need the space to just breathe and then come back and move that, the, the excessive energy that's still there lingering. Yes. You have the 12, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. That's the so gate I of have, caution. Yeah. Yep. And I have the 22 and then Sean has the 12 and, and, and the 22 is in my incarnation cross. The 12 is in his our incarnation cross. So very prominent placements in your charts. Yes. I mean, we would argue about the dishes and all of a sudden it would turn into something explosive where I'm like, how did we start this argument? The dishes? Did you like you put them away or I didn't put them away or so I, it's just the, the way it can explode is so intense and and space is our best friend with that energy. It's not good or bad because when it is good, when we move through emotional experiences together, especially when they're positive or moving, like they're very powerful. They're core memories for me in our relationship. But when that energy needs to move and we're frustrated, stepping away is, is the best thing either of us can do. And I, I agree with you. I used to feel guilt, like we need to solve this or something is really wrong. But in reality, we both just needed to go and move that in a way that didn't involve the other. So then we could come back and say, okay, that just happened. Is there anything we need to take from that? Or can we move forward now? Um, yeah, it was a source of a lot of pain for me personally when we first started dating. Um, but it is such a beautiful energy when used in a, in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah. And also sometimes knowing that thing doesn't take away the hard, <laughs> yes. the hard parts of working with those energies of what might be triggered of our inner wounds and all that. But having, again, just the language to point it can be very supportive in holding that. Yeah. You know that you bring up such a good point too, because I, I think what the 2212 has done for us is it's invited us into these very emotional experiences that maybe we've tried to bypass or move just mm. ignore or haven't really addressed and um when we can sit with each other after a moment and say you know wow I was feeling really frustrated I think that's stemming from xyz I don't feel heard I don't feel seen or I like this was something that happened in the past to me that I guess I really never moved through and now it's coming up how do we move through it together in this moment um that's something I think that channel and, and just our designs in, in general have invited us into those conversations when we are ready and in a place to talk about it. Um, and I, I found that, you know, with the 22, I want to be in my moods. I want to be in it. And, you know, just because I want to be in a mood or in something, I want to go through something in that exact moment doesn't mean that somebody else wants to be in that with me. And I can't try to force or control someone to go through that until they're ready. And especially you with the 12, like maybe this, maybe this is resonating that you really move through it when you are ready. Yeah. You're yeah. ready to express it in your own time. Yes. Which is the hardest part when, you know, the back of our minds, like this argument, this disagreement is causing us a lot of pain. Let's fix it right now. <laughs> but it just like, no, sometimes time and space away helps. And also knowing that, there's nothing wrong with these conversations, I think, because you just brought in the beauty of these relationships and what you're able to kind of help each other heal and grow from. And I think both of you have the undefined solar plexus as well. So when you come together, that's when all the emotions are. <laughs> yes, yes. Learning about that has been really powerful too. And 
the clearing out practices, even if it's just awareness of it. Okay, what are we bringing home? Um, who have we just spent a lot of time around? Do we need to do something? Like for us, walking is really therapeutic and it's a great thing we can do with all our boys. We have a dog. Um, so for us, anytime we're feeling a little emotionally overwhelmed, anytime that tension is building, um, to be able to like, as a family, pile everybody out and go spend a half hour in, in nature on a walk, like to move that energy is so, is so powerful and to, and to know that it's not always ours. Mm -hmm. The emotions we're bringing home, the things we're taking, we're, we're experiencing aren't always ours. Um, and that's been real. I think that's been really powerful too. Uh, releasing what's not yours. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> what are some ways you, what are some practices that you use to help release that? Yeah. Uh, getting outside. That's the number one for me. I, I find that no matter what I'm feeling, um, if I can step outside, even take a few deep breaths, like on our back patio, um, or go for a quick walk, that is the easiest and quickest way for me to move that energy, um, and to release what's not mine. Um, breath work for sure. Um, and I don't do anything fancy for me. It's really just intentional deep breathing. Um, legs up the wall is something I love to do, especially in the yeah. evening. Um, is, is before I go to bed, throwing my legs up against the wall and, and doing a few deep breaths, closing my eyes. Um, those are a few things that I think have been really great. I also, I regularly see an acupuncturist. Um, I'll do float tanks. Uh, I, I really try to prioritize and invest in my well-being when I can. Um, it's not always possible or accessible, but um, those are things that are super supportive. Thank you for sharing these. And yeah, it's not always as, um, accessible or possible, but when it is, it is, it can be so nice and nourishing because sometimes even as a woman or a mother, like you're so, your attention is pulled into taking care of others, guiding others as a projector. This is almost like you are designed to guide, but we can forget about ourselves very easily. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Or even like, I can sometimes see the overwhelm coming, but I'm just don't even feel like I have the capacity to deal with it. Um, I'm getting better at that um, because I can take 10 seconds and take a couple deep breaths. Like no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I can do that. Um, but there certainly have been times in my life where I don't even feel like I have capacity to, to move, you know, move things through my body or release things um, in the heat of the moment. Um, so it's a practice for sure. It's a practice. Mm, a beautiful practice. <laughs> the messy <laughs> life that it can be. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, one thing that I think I've really tried to embody more of is lightness and humor. Um, I've always been very serious. You know, I love to go, I love to go deep. I love to get into things. I take everything I do really seriously. I want to have serious conversations. You know, I can just, I just have this, like, that's what I tend to do. And, um, when I really becoming a mother has invited this practice into me is to just find levity in these situations. You know, my, my son is having a meltdown. The quickest way to move through his anger is to make him laugh truly. And to almost like to help him get, it's like, it's like this spectrum of emotion, right. Of, of pure rage that then turns into this like laugh crying. And all of a sudden we're both belly laughing. And if I can remind myself in those really hard moments to, to lighten up, I, it's so powerful what it offers us, all of us. And, um, that's something I'm really trying to practice more of. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I think even as adults, we could use that practice. <laughs> yes. I'm like, when did I become so wound up? <laughs> you know, like lighten up a little bit. We're alive. We're healthy. We're here. We have like, I always think like we have so much, we so cheesy, but we do. We have so in our family, we have so much to be grateful for and to wake up and, and to be able to even experience those moments of of frustration and anger with my son and to be able to be present enough to hold space for him. Um, like sometimes I just, I am so annoyed and I want to move through it really quickly. I want it to just end. And, um, but the more I fight it, the worse it gets too. So if we can all just surrender to that moment, lighten up in that moment, um, that's been, that's been a practice. I'm really, I'm really being intentional about. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I know you've also been diving deeper into your own chart in addition to guiding people. What are some of, I guess, the lessons you're holding present right now? That's such a good question. Um, I really am connecting on a deeper level with my spleen and my splenic authority. Um, I've always, since finding human design, have understood it in theory, but practicing it, the true art of surrender, the true art of trusting that my body and my intuition is going to guide me into the places and spaces and to the people that I need to. Um, that's something I'm really practicing now and not just theorizing. Um, undefined identity center for sure is something I really love about myself now that I didn't love about myself before. The question of who am I today? Who I, who do I get to be today is a really empowering question that I'm sitting with. Um, and what else is really calling out to me? I think I've been really sitting a lot with my gate 47 personality son. That was a really hard energy for me to understand. And I'm still unpacking it. So for gate 47 lives up in the um, Ajna and it's part of the sensing circuit. It's all around, it's all around dealing and looking at experiences of the past. And, and, and this is my interpretation of it, right? Offering a new or fresh perspective. Um, and I, and I'm recognizing that I do that really, really well for other people. And that when I try to do it on myself, um, I spiral. <laughs> and I have spent a lot of my life spiraling in anxiety, um, reliving old conversations, old experiences, wondering why things happen the way they did, wondering how that's going to impact stuff going forward. Um, it, I've lived in a lot of anxiety with that energy. And so um, I don't have it all figured out, but that's something I'm, I'm really developing a deeper awareness of about myself. Yeah. And this is the energy that is meant for the collective. That was something that I was like, whoa, there's energies within us and it can support that. But also like, and so many of us tend to use those energies to apply it inwards. Yeah. And it can be so detrimental when we do that. Um, and and then also, you know, I mean, some of these major energies of our chart, what I'm, I've noticed with working with people is they're so natural to you that it's like breathing. You don't understand that you're an amazing orator. You don't understand that you have incredible, this well of ideas. You don't understand that the sacral energy you bring to the table has impact on everybody, right? Like most of the stuff we do and we're like, oh yeah, that thing. I, I didn't even know that I did that. Um, and that's something I really recognized about gate 47 is, is really seeing in the other, okay, what have your experiences been in the past? How do we weave those together and paint this picture of who you are now? And, and simply just walking someone through that process and, and sharing my perspective, um, is something that I'm realizing is, is really helpful for some people. And so I'm, I'm definitely leaning into that. Mm. Yeah. And I can imagine how, because this energy is pretty present, even, you know, when you're undefined and then when it gets defined, but then also your spleen is sort of guiding you, but then this energy, because it's your personality set, it might try to take away from whatever decision or whatever intuition you got hit in the moment. Oh, I always, you know, I, I think I, I was listening to a previous podcast of yours where you talked a lot about numbness and the feeling of being numb. I spent, I would say, probably the first 30 years of my life, totally numb for many reasons that we talked about earlier, right around doing the right thing and following the path and being this, you know, poster child of success, um, made me very numb to myself. And then I also always joked that I was just a floating head. Like I was so disconnected from my body, even though I was doing, I was teaching the yoga and doing the things, um, I lived in my head and I still catch myself there very, very often and have to remind myself that, you know, I can convince myself to do about anything, to, to do anything or not do anything um, when I live in that space and, and the amount of energy I've expended in my head, reliving stories and, and possibilities and 
um, being in that anxious space um, has been exhausting. And then I'm wondering, pair with the divine heart that can commit to anything you say your mind to. Uh, for me, that was like the worst, not the worst combination, but a combination that was, that led me to a lot of heart learn lessons. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that defined heart. I know. I I also have gate 29, the gate, which is the gate of commitment, the gate of yes. And so yeah, the amount of times I found myself in commitments that were really hard to get out of because I had committed to them. My heart was in it, you know, and and I'm sure you feel the same way. Um, and then if I walked away from something, well, I'm a failure. Oh, <laughs> and now it starts the spiral of what's next? How do I figure this out? Why did this happen? What are all of these events in my life leading me to? I love how right now, as you talk about it, I sense this ease of, of no pressure of like, of really trying to beat ourselves. I was like, why did this happen? It's more like, yeah, that was where I was going. And now I'm able to hold the question. Yeah. yeah I'm just so tired of trying to <laughs> experiences and understand them <laughs> that I just, I'm like, I'm very consciously setting them down. And I had an incarnation cross reading, um, with Teo, uh, who we both have spent a lot of time learning from, um, and how he described gate 47 to me, he talked a lot about the art of surrendering to the moment, you know, just surrender to whatever situation that you're in. And, and I, again, I want to, I want to preface this and, and, and say that I, you know, I'm not tra super trauma informed. And so let's just hold this lightly if we can. But for me personally, can I surrender to whatever circumstance I'm in right now so that I can see clearly enough to move forward? Because what was happening was I was fighting my current situation, whatever I was in, I was fighting my, my current and my past self so much, just beating myself up, trying to understand why and how could I have done things differently or how could I have shown up differently or said something differently or chosen differently. And, um, and it was totally keeping me stuck. It was keeping me absolutely trapped, like paralyzed from moving forward with my life. And, um, so that was really powerful to say, okay, it feels light for me to say, whatever happened that I'm setting down, wherever I'm at right now, I'm going to take a look around and assess, and I'm going to be here so that I can see really clearly my next best step. And that's always been my prayer, right? Show me my next best step. Wow. Well, that was such a moving process of everything that you're holding, because I can imagine so many people learn about these energies and then doesn't take away the stuckness that we might feel around them. But, you know, hearing about your experience and learning to, you know, detach yourself a little bit from that, knowing that this energy is always going to be present, <laughs> but also the detachment from it and the surrender. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> A work in progress. <laughs> I am no means an expert. I am fully in this experiment right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a playfulness to it suddenly. I feel like after learning human design, it's like, oh, okay, this is what happens. It's almost like, what are the possibilities, <laughs> the limitless possibilities from it? Well, and you're a six line, right? You're a four six. Yeah. So you are up on the roof right now, right? And yes. I'm sure that has been such a wild experience for you too, of reevaluating all of these pieces of your life and saying, how do I want to move forward? And yes, having a tool like human design to bring some lightness and curiosity to the process. Yeah. I thought before human design that I was just getting old and tired of everything because I could really feel that aloof energy. Like it's so strong compared to how as, as a teenager until my thirties, before my thirties, it was like so much FOMO. I was down for anything. Oh, when it, like, you know, the four ones to go out. I was like, but also projector two centers. I didn't have the energy to keep up, but I was like, I'm down. And now it's like, I don't care. And then when I learn about the roof, I'm like, oh, okay. I think I understand now why I've been healing so much, why I've been on this phase that I just felt myself pulled into. So yeah. <laughs> yes, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I have um, several four sixes in my life. I'm very close to that. I love and adore deeply. And the six line in general, I am, I'm just fascinated by, I love everyone in my life who has a six line and I have witnessed this process over and over and over with, again, with them where you do hit that phase of going on the roof and your life really shifts sometimes in very dramatic ways. Yeah. Yeah. You're a two, four. So there must be some tension between wanting to do your own thing and also like wanting to hang out with people. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I recently wrote a post that was, that was a beautiful reminder for myself of, I don't need to do this alone, but I'd really like to, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, as a second line, single definition projector, all of these open centers, I for sure would prefer to just be in my cocoon and do, um, and do things on my own and do them my way and not disturb or interrupt anybody else on the process. Um, and I, I, uh, I had a session with a mutual friend of ours, uh, relatively recently, Allison Forseth and Allison said like point blank to me, she's like, if you think you were meant to do this all alone, you're wrong you are a fourth line with community circuitry. And that has been really powerful for me to remember that even though, yes, I would prefer like a cabin in the woods where I can just hang out and do my own thing. That is not how I'm going to serve others and, and, and use my energy um, in the most, I think, powerful and impactful way. It really has to come through my community. And as a projector, you're here to guide. How can you guide if there's no energy to guide? You're not here to guide. Yeah. We're not here to guide ourselves. <laughs> yeah. If I just burrow in like I want to, there's no one around. And in what I found, you know, I really actually feel like I was in that phase. So when I, when we had our twins, I, I stayed home um, while we, we figured out what the heck we were going to do. Um, and I, I've been home with them now for a little over a year. Um, and there was a really long period of time where I, I didn't really leave the house, you know, trying to navigate two babies. They hated car rides. They hated stroller rides. Like I couldn't hardly even take them for a walk for the first eight or nine months. Um, and I, I realized how isolating that second line can be and how comfortable I got in that place, but how unhappy I was. I was so unwell um, mentally and emotionally because I had been cut off from my network at the knees. Mm. And I had my immediate family. I had my my parents, my in-laws, but that was pretty much, that was it. That was all I saw. And um, yeah, how detrimental that second line energy can become when you move too far into hermit mode um, and how much better my life has become even in the last few months by very consciously re-engaging with my network and reevaluating what my network looks like now. Mm. Such beautiful reflections that I'm sure are resonating with so many people. Oh Oh my gosh. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about your programs and what you offer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, right now I offer, I do mostly one-on-one work um, and that feels really good for me right now. I do uh, foundational sessions. um, So if you're brand new to human design, um, you know, we can, we can introduce you to your chart, uh, though. I have to say, I have a really hard time sticking to the basics. <laughs> and I, was, I know. I wonder, do you feel that way? Yes. Yes. I can easily like weave in something yeah. else. And then I'm like, and then I realize it's a lot of information. Just like when I first learned, I was like, I'm hungry. I tried to like swallow the whole buffet. And then afterwards, like my head hurts. Why did I try to do this? And things click, they do click, but it takes time. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what I'm finding, so I offer foundation session, I offer deep dive session, we go into the deeper layers of your chart, but really the bread and butter for me is when I can, um, when I can work with someone and we really resonate um, with each other, I'm, I'm feeling um, like I'm, I'm helping and supporting and offering good guidance and they feel really seen, heard and recognized. Um, we work together on a longer term basis and um So I, those sessions for me are called intuition intensives and they're really like you schedule as needed. Um, We meet for an hour. We, we dive into whatever's present in your life using your design as our primary lens. You go out, you integrate, um, you do whatever you'd like to do until you're feeling that hunger for more information or to regroup. And then we come back again. Uh, Something that I, I found really frustrating for 
for myself was I would, I would have an amazing beginning or foundation reading with someone and then I would never see them again. I would never talk to them again. Do you feel this way? Yeah. I send them emails like, how are you doing? If you have a question, let me know. Cause I'm like, I just want to know. And some people are like, I'm processing. I'm like, okay, I'm here. If you need <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Maybe it's the projector at us um, <laughs> or the fourth line. Right. But I, I really, um, of course, honored people's space, but um, I wanted to provide a, a, an option or an opportunity for people to return when they felt like they wanted to learn more um, or they wanted to dive into a really specific area of their life. Um, because yeah, I, I would really, I, I felt invested in their success and in their growth and in whatever it was they were tackling. And so it's been very nourishing for me personally to work with somebody on an ongoing basis, even if they're only coming every few months for a session. Um, that's felt really good to start building those longer term relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just so good at it, at picking things out and also holding space. So definitely check it out. I'll add your offerings in the side note as well. But okay. as much as I don't want to end this, <laughs> we can, and that's what I tell every guest. I'm like, let's do a part two. Let's just talk again. You know, this is the fourth, like, I want to know what happens to your life a few months or maybe a year from now. So <laughs> yeah, so I am. I'm very grateful that you invited me to be here, and I any opportunity I get to to share space with you and have conversation is um, is so beautiful and really fulfilling. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I wanted to wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. <laughs> hey, <I'm nervous. laughs> keep you on your toes before the end. <laughs> um, but you might have heard them before, so here goes. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? That some, somebody in a session once told me that being in session with me was like coming home to themselves. And that felt really, that felt really gratifying. Yeah. I felt chills right now. <laughs> um, a book that's changed your life. A book that's changed my life. Oh gosh. Um, What is changing? What has changed my life? Um, for some reason, this keeps coming up for me right now, but uh, Molecules of Emotion is a really beautiful book that blew my mind open to the mind-body connection and how we can actually measure and experience emotions in our body. Um, that was, I think, my first entry point into this whole world of of somatics and the, and the, the whole human experience. Oh, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. yeah. advice or words for your younger self. I heard a quote recently, um, that is really sticking with me and it's never link your confidence to your abilities, link your confidence to your intention. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to tell my younger self that. What does coming home mean to you? It's such a buzz phrase right now, but radical self-acceptance, loving yourself through all of it without shame or judgment to me feels really like coming home. What would you like more of? Play, more play right now. Yeah. And where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram. Um, I'm at Maggie Hillpish and or on my website, MaggieHillpish.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Maggie. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. I love sharing space with you. Thank you for being here. Any final words you want to share? Anything that you feel it's lingering, <laughs> wants to be moved? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I would love to, to do this again sometime. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect within, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.